Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Griebel, and this video is part 10 of a Bible study based on the Gospel of John. Our focus today will be on chapter 7. As we always do when we begin, we have our opening hymn. Today is All Christians Who Have Been Baptized. Christians who have been baptized, who know the God of heaven, and in whose daily life is prized the name of Christ once given. Consider now what Christ has done, the gifts he gives to everyone baptized into Christ Jesus. You were before your day of birth, indeed from your conception, condemned and lost with all the earth, none good without exception. For like your parents' flesh and blood Turned inward from the highest good You constantly denied him But all of that was washed away Immersed and drowned forever the water of your baptism day restored again whatever old adam in his sin destroyed and all our sinful selves employed according to our nature in baptism we now put on Christ, our shame is fully covered. With all that he once sacrificed and freely for us suffered. For here the flood of his own blood now makes us holy, right, and good before our Heavenly Father. And we turn to our opening prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, let's get right to our Bible study. As I said, today we're focusing on the seventh chapter of John. It's a good thing to have your Bible handy because we'll be referring back to specific verses as we go through our study. Once again, we're going to divide the chapter into two parts. We're going to look at the first part, which is verses 1 through 31. Look it over, ask some questions, respond to some questions, and then take a look at the second half. So, starting then with John chapter 7, verses 1 through 31. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. 
for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast, I am not going up to the fe this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, he then also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people, while some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet, for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he never has studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but, it, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment." Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, Will he do more signs than this man has done? So that's the first part of John chapter 7. Let's take a look at some specific verses. So first of all, the question is, some wanted to make Jesus king. We heard about that in the previous chapter, John chapter 6. After Jesus fed the 5,000, it says that some people wanted to take him and make him king by force. He was so popular and so well-liked. While on the other hand, some wanted to kill him, as we see in several verses throughout chapter 7. And the question is, has anything changed? The only reaction you cannot have to Jesus is indifference. If you look at what Jesus said and truly analyze the things he himself said attributed to him in the Bible, you come to one of two conclusions. Either he's a complete lunatic, and yes, he should be killed or at least gotten rid of in some way, or he truly is who he said he is, the one sent from heaven by the Father to be the Savior of the world. The only option you cannot have is indifference, because once you read about who he truly is, it's either yes, he is who he says he is, or no, he's a complete fool, and we should get rid of him. That's... <laughs> There's no room for neutral ground when it comes to Jesus. 
So this all took place at the Feast of Booths, as it called. And what did the Feast of Booths commemorate? It's also known as the Feast of Tabernacles because it was a feast to remind the people of Israel that they had lived in tents or tabernacles in the wilderness for 40 years. And especially to remind them that all the time they lived in those tents in the wilderness, God took care of them. And so it was a very important feast to remind them that no matter what situation they faced currently, that God would take care of them. If he took care of them for 40 years in the wilderness while they lived in tents, he would also take care of them anytime, no matter what situation they were in. And it's a good reminder for us as well that he will take care of us. So it also says they, they had this, this discussion about going up to the feast because Jesus was in Galilee, the feast was in Jerusalem and Judea. And of course his disciples wanted to go because they were required to go. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to go. And it says even that his own brothers did not believe in him. One of the reasons they were encouraging Jesus to go to the feast was so that he could continue to teach and explain that he truly was who he claimed to be. And then it makes this little comment that even his brothers didn't believe in him. So if he went to the feast, maybe he could even convince his brothers to believe in him. So the question then is, what would you think if a prophet comes along today and he's really great and getting a great following and everybody says he's so great and, and then you find out, oh, even his own family members don't believe in him. Well, it might impact your opinion of that person if his own family doesn't agree and believe in him. Fortunately for Jesus, we are told in the book of Acts then that eventually after Jesus rose from the dead, and as the church began to be founded and expanded through the Holy Spirit and Pentecost, his brothers did eventually come to believe in Jesus. So then why, did not, why didn't Jesus go to the feast? As he says, my time has not yet come. He mentions that a couple of times, which raises the, but then he did go up anyway. So he says initially, I'm not going because my time has not yet come. And then he goes up anyway. Well, does that sound a little familiar to you? When else did Jesus say his time had not yet come and then he went ahead and did something anyway? Well, in his first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, uh, it's, his mother comes to him and says they have no more wine. And his response is, dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And then what does he do? He goes ahead and helps the situation out by turning the water into wine. So it's kind of a similar situation here where initially he says, nope, not going to do it. My time has not yet come. And then he goes ahead and does it. And so that's kind of what happened at his first miracle at Cana of Galilee. So Jesus says, the world hates me. I'm not going to go up because the world hates me. And why is that? As he says, the world hates Jesus because he testifies that its works are evil. None of us like to be told that we are evil. And Jesus, he wouldn't hold back. He would tell us today, tell the people back then, you're evil, you need to repent, you need to turn to me for forgiveness. And some people do that and confess by God's grace. We confess and believe in Jesus. Others, no way. I'm not going to confess my sins. I'm not going to admit I'm evil and admit that I need a savior. So that's just the way it is. And then it says, so the feast started and everybody's talking about Jesus. It's kind of like they're attending this event, which is supposed to be a big deal, but nobody's really paying attention to the feast that's going on. They all want to talk about Jesus, but they can't talk about him openly because they were afraid of the Jews. The Jews as had already said, don't follow this guy. In fact, we're trying to get rid of him. We're trying to kill him, so don't follow him. And yet they were muttering around, talking, well, who is he? Who is he going to show up? They just couldn't help themselves talking about Jesus. But they didn't do it openly because they were afraid of the Jews. And then what fact did Jesus' enemies want people to overlook by accusing Jesus of having a demon? Such a common tactic of the devil. When he gets pinned down, you try to pin him down on every, anything, he changes the subject and, 
and goes off on a tangent. And that's exactly what the Jewish leaders were trying to do. Je Jesus was pointing out to them, you know, you say Moses is your leader and the one you respect and honor from the Old Testament, but you're not really following his ways. And so that's, again, Jesus was testifying that their deeds were evil. They were pretending that they were following the ways of Jesus, but Moses knew they were not when it come to, came to the Sabbath day and so many other things related to the laws of Moses. They weren't following Moses. So what do the people do instead of saying, yeah, Jesus, you're right, we probably should do a better job of following G uh, Moses? No, they turned it and they changed the subject and said, this man has a demon. And they say it several times uh, in not only in this chapter, but in chapter 8, a couple times in chapter 8, and then again in chapter 10. They just flat out say, Jesus has a demon, don't follow him. And they do that to deflect attention from themselves because they weren't truly following Moses. They didn't want anybody to expose them and their lack of following the laws of Moses. And then Jesus says, talks about judging. And the question then is, what about judging? Are we to judge others? We just let it, leave it up to God. God is the one who judges, so we can just back off and not get into anybody's business. Well, what does Jesus really think about it? In verse 24, Jesus does not forbid all judging. He simply says, do not judge based on appearances. So some of the things Jesus was doing, like when he healed the man in the pool of Bethesda, and then told him to pick up his bed and walk, even though it was the Sabbath day. Outwardly, it looks like Jesus was breaking the Sabbath day, and they completely overlooked the fact that Jesus healed the man and did a great miracle for the man. So uh, based on appearances, there were things that they could pick apart about Jesus because they never took the time to, to look and see what's really going on here. And the same... And the same is true when we come to judging. We shouldn't just judge on appearances, on the outside, external things. Let's make sure we know what's going on, maybe the hidden things that are going on that people are overlooking and that maybe we have overlooked. Don't just judge by appearances. And then when it comes to judging also in Matthew chapter 2, this is what Jesus says, For with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, when it comes to judging, think about how you would like to be judged. And then consider that when you are thinking about judging others. Stop and ask yourself, am I treating this person the way I would want to be treated? It's the, it's the golden rule, which Jesus gets to in just a few verses there in Matthew chapter 7, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it applies to judging as well. Not necessarily a blanket forbidding all judging, but keep in mind, if you're going to judge people, think about uh, are you judging in the way that you would want to be judged? So again, this topic comes up about where Jesus is from. And they are all convinced he's from Galilee, and since he's from Galilee, there's no prophet that comes from Galilee, and certainly not the Messiah. And so that's another reason why they wanted to reject Jesus. Because for the Jews, it was very important where someone came from, especially if the prophets had told about it, that the Savior is coming and here's where he will be from. You know? They honored the prophets in that way, and as they looked at the prophets, it didn't add up that Jesus was from Galilee and claiming to be the Christ. And so it was very important for them. And it's still important today. When someone comes and he wants us to believe in him and follow him or her or whatever, we always you know, want to know, where'd you, where'd you come from? Where'd you get your education? Where'd you get your information? And so on and so forth before we really want to commit to following you. Same is true for the Jews when it came to Jesus. They wanted to know where he was from. And then the question is, who else wanted to know where Jesus was from? Well, during his trial, before Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked the same question.
It says in John chapter 19, Pilate entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? So even Pontius Pilate, before he condemned Jesus to die, wanted to know who this Jesus was from, wanted to know why the Jews were so stirred up about Jesus and why they were so committed to having him crucified and die. He just wanted to know, where are you from, Jesus? Why, why are you causing such a stir, such hatred? It must be maybe f because of where you're from or what. That was just another question that Pilate asked as he was examining Jesus before he condemned him to be crucified. So that's uh, the first section of John chapter 7, verses 1 through 31. And so now let's take a look at the next half, the second half of John chapter 7, verses 32 to 52. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So that's the second half of John chapter 7. First question there, based on chapter 32, it says that uh, the Jewish authorities, the religious authorities, sent soldiers to arrest Jesus. Now think about that in today's terms. What if pastors and other religious leaders had at their disposals had at their disposal soldiers that they could send to arrest people if they wanted to get rid of them and wanted to put them in prison or whatever. That is so strange, especially to our American ears, where we have the separation of church and state. Now, in some countries, the religious leaders do still today have some uh, uh, earthly authority and would have soldiers at their uh, uh, disposal to send them different places and that's what was going on here the religious authority the religious leaders sent soldiers to arrest Jesus that's just so foreign to our way of thinking especially as Americans so Jesus says I'm only going to be here a little while and then I'm going to be gone and you won't see me anymore I will no longer be physically visibly present among you and so they're wondering what does that mean? He's going to be gone. Is he going to the dispersion? And so what is the dispersion? After the fall of Jerusalem in the 6th century BC, 
the Jews were dispersed throughout several regions, including Babylon, which is today's Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. And as time went on, Jews also were dispersed into Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Asia, and even into Europe. The mixed assembly from which the first converts were gathered on the day of Pentecost represented each area of the dispersion. The dispersion then enabled the gospel to spread quickly throughout the world. So because of the wickedness of the Jews, God sent them into exile. And they were literally spread throughout the world as the time went on, centuries went on. And yet God had a plan because of the dispersion. Um, when the time came time to spread the gospel, the disciples were sent out and pretty much everywhere they went, the first thing they did was try to find if they're out, if there were any Jews in the area. And that's where they would always start. And lo and behold, because of the dispersion, they found Jews pretty much spread throughout the world. And so they were then able to spread the God that really helped them in spreading the gospel because the Jews were already there, already knew about the coming of the Savior. They just picked it up right there and said, hey, we have seen the Savior. He's come. Let, let us tell you about him. And so then, starting with the Jews, they would witness to them. And then, typically, then they would start reaching out to the Gentiles in the area as well. So there's kind of three parts to this feast, Jesus coming to this feast. He, first of all, as it says, we read back earlier in the first part of the chapter, he comes up in secret and nobody knows he's there. He's in disguise somehow. And then the second part, he starts, he goes to the temple and he starts disputing with the people and talking to them. And, and they're like, okay, I thought the, the Jews were trying to arrest this person. What's he doing in the temple? preaching and teaching. And then the third part, this is the part here, where Jesus stands up at the end of the feast and he says, come to me and drink. And this is very similar to what we read in Isaiah chapter 55. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's pretty much what Jesus says. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Similar to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 55. And what does Jesus' offer indicate? So as it says, he says this on the last day of the feast, the greatest day of the feast, a day on which no one should be hungry, no one should be thirsty. They've been celebrating this great feast all week long, it lasted for seven days, and the greatest day was the last day when there would be the biggest feast of all. No one should be hungry or thirsty, and yet Jesus stands up and says, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. Why would he do that? Why would he say that? Well, this reminds us that everything before Jesus does not really satisfy. All of these Old Testament feasts and ceremonial laws pointed to Jesus and find their fulfillment in Jesus. They were not the end point. They were not in themselves the end. They pointed to something greater, including this feast. And so even though they were feasting in the middle of a feast, Jesus could stand up and say, basically, what you're doing here, yes, it is in accord with Moses, and you're commanded to do it, but it can never truly satisfy only I can satisfy. Come to me, and I will give you living water, water that will swell up to eternal life. As it says then, why did Jesus wait to give the Spirit until after he had been glorified? According to chapter 14, verse 26, the Spirit's job is to testify to what Jesus did, but since Jesus had not yet finished his work, the Spirit would not be able to tell about everything Jesus had done. So, Jesus waited to complete his ministry, do everything he had come to do. Then the Holy Spirit was poured out on people. And as Jesus calls it here, the Spirit is living water that wells up to eternal life. So then we, get, we have also here in this section another discussion about where Jesus is from. He's from Galilee, so he can't be worth anything. How hard would it have been for the Jewish leaders to clear up the misunderstanding about Jesus' place of origin? 
How hard would it have been to go and talk to his family? His mother was still there, but we don't know if Joseph was still there. And so this story may also be an indication and reminder that by this time, Joseph had passed away. Yes, they could have asked Mary, but for many Jewish people, they would simply not rely on the testimony of a woman. That would not be considered proof if it just was something a woman had said. And so this is perhaps another indication that by now Joseph had died because they could have gone and asked Joseph. And Joseph could have easily told them. And since he was a man, they would have believed him. Yes, remember that census we had? Because of the census, we had to leave Galilee, go to, Nazareth, go to Bethlehem, and it was in Bethlehem that Jesus was actually born. They could have cleared up that confusion with just some simple investigation, but they had already made up their minds. Jesus was from Galilee. No prophet comes from Galilee, so we're not going to believe him. So as I said, the soldiers had sent to arrest Jesus, had sent by the religious leaders to arrest Jesus, and they didn't. They came back to the Jewish leaders empty-handed. Why? Because they had, as they said, they had never heard anyone speak like Jesus. Still today, there's no other message, no other person like Jesus. And he is truly the Savior. And then uh, finally we hear from Nicodemus, who had come to him earlier at night. What important aspect of Jewish law does Nicodemus point out? We don't condemn someone until we first give him a hearing. And that was Jewish law. But here they were already condemning Jesus before they gave him a, a formal hearing. And this is a biblical law that was, until social media came along, that was an important element of Western law. Nowadays, more and more, it seems that something bad happens, especially related now lately to our police or to racism or whatever. And there's a video that gets posted to social media and it gets shared millions of times and everybody's watched it. And then they all make up their mind and they all decide, okay, this person is bad. This person is good. This shouldn't have happened. And before any charges have been filed or anyone's been able to do an investigation or any kind of fair hearing has been held, everybody's already made up their minds based on this video. Well, as Nicodemus points out here, don't make up your mind about things. That was a Jewish law. We don't decide things until someone has been given a hearing. And so Nicodemus simply reminded the people of their own laws, which they didn't like. And they thought Nicodemus, then they uh, turned on him, one of their own, just because he wanted to defend Jesus in a little bit. But that's still a very important part of our Western law. A person is considered innocent until proven guilty. And so everyone has the right to a fair trial. We don't condemn someone until they've been heard. And that is truly one of the foundational points of our society and civilization in the Western world. So that concludes our study of John chapter 7. Let's conclude with the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.